at, at that point, were you involved with the Bloods? No. So that happened after your incarceration? Well, well no. Um, I'm mistakenly believed to have been affiliated with that group. I am not affiliated with that group. Well, how do you explain your tattoo? Well, it means multiple things. It's ambiguous. It means my own boss. It also means uh, money over. You know what it means? What are you? What is? What are you telling us it means? <laughs> my own boss. Really? And where did you get the idea to tattoo MLB for my own boss on yourself? We are about to watch a commutation hearing for a man who did a home invasion in Connecticut. He's looking to reduce time that he has to serve on his sentence. Thanks to Richard, we have all the documents that we will go through after this case. The vi there's a victim impact speech and the DA who prosecuted this case shows up to talk. With that, let's jump in. An attorney? Yes. State's Attorney's Office. Good afternoon. This is the March 13, 2024 commutation session of the Board of Pardons and Paroles being held at, excuse me, Carl Robinson Correctional Institution. My name is Pro Officer Dunkley, and I am the hearing coordinator for today's session. Additional board staff are also present to assist with the hearing. Presiding over today's hearing will be Chairperson Jennifer Zaccanini, who will now say a few words. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Zaccanini, Chairperson. Other board members with me today are Referral Page and Michael Paul. Uh, welcome, everyone. The people of the state of Connecticut have vested the Board of Pardons and Paroles with extraordinary power to grant commutations of punishment, releases, and pardons, conditioned or absolute, for convictions in the state. A commutation, if granted, may result in a reduction of your sentence. The board may also decide to release you from your sentence. In considering if to grant any form of relief, the board looks at, among other things, the nature and circumstance of the crime, its impact on any victim, the length of time that has elapsed since the commission of the crime, any efforts the applicant has made toward rehabilitation during their incarceration, and any compelling or exceptional circumstances. As an applicant will be heard today, your case has been reviewed thoroughly by the board. I wish you the best. The hearing coordinator will give you further information. Please note that there have been any changes to your conviction status or you have had any new arrests filing your application for relief with the board. You must disclose such information to the board today. Additionally, without exception, any form of commutation granted by the board today may be revoked at, at any time for good cause shown. As stated by the chair, your application has been fully reviewed by the board. The board is familiar with your case, has read and examined your written submissions, including any written letters in support or against your application for commutation. The panel members <clears throat> have copies of those letters in their files and have completely and thoroughly reviewed those files in preparation for today's hearing. There is no need to repeat what has already been submitted in writing. The purpose of your appearance today is to allow you to make a brief presentation to the board while adding any information that is not already in your file. You are required to tell the board why you are seeking relief. The board may issue a decision to you today. However, you will receive a letter by mail informing you of the board's decision within two weeks. Mr. White, as part of your testimony, <clears throat> you are required to be sworn in. Please raise your right hand. The appropriate response to this testament is I do. Do you solemnly swear and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, to help you God or upon the penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. White, for the record, please clearly state your name and inmate number to the board. Andre D. White. Board, Sorry, go ahead. Um, excuse me. Andre D. White. Three nine one two three two inmate number. With the board's permission, you may proceed to explain why you believe you deserve to leave. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. All right. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, honorable ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, I wrote a letter today. Um I want to thank the board for allowing me to be here at this stage of the process. I'm very appreciative of the opportunity. First and foremost, I want to apologize to the victim for partaking in the home invasion of his home on the night of April 7th, 2013. 
I would like him to know that I am truly sorry and I desperately wish this crime never occurred. I fully fathom the impact it has had on him, the mental, emotional, and financial pain he's had to endure due to this crime. I also acknowledge that this may have permanently impacted his life. And I shamefully take full responsibility for causing that. I am deeply remorseful for my horrendous actions and on what should have been an ordinary night for the victim. I regret it deeply and I wish I could take it back. No one should ever have to experience such a life altering event like the one caused that night. And again, I'm truly sorry and remorseful for my selfish, immature, and extremely reckless actions. That was of poor judgment. This has been unclear for years that I was the one who told the victim I was sorry about what was happening the night of the crime. In all these years, I've kept quiet because I was avoiding responsibility for my own actions. And again, I'm sorry for that. I would like for the victim and the board to know that I am not the same person that I was the night I committed this crime. Over the last decade, I've evolved into a much better person, beginning with my understanding of self, community, and family values. I wouldn't want my family or myself to be a victim of such a crime or any crime, and there isn't any justification for my actions. I wasn't raised to do this to anyone, and I should have never done it in this case. I'm willing to make it up to the victim in the community in any way afforded to me. I can adamantly say I have learned my lesson and I will never indulge in a life of crime again. I also want to take this time to apologize to the prosecutors who's handled this case for wasting their time and resources on a case I knew I was guilty of. I was too young, immature, and careless to understand I was making bad decisions. Also, I was in reckless disregard for any accountability or responsibility for this crime. And I fully acknowledge I was wrong. I want to emphasize my sincerest apologies to them as well. I have learned that when we commit crimes against people, we never fully pay attention or think about the lasting impact that it causes mentally, physically, and emotionally and financially. These are things we disregard before we commit these acts. I have learned how to have structure, accountability, responsibility, patience, good decision-making, and discipline. I've also learned how to be a hard worker and to be fully committed in everything I do and to be successful without indulging into negativity. I learned that in order to be the best version of myself, I have to think, eat, and breathe positivity. <clears throat> so I made this group, I made growth and personal development my top priority, and I took initiative by completing the programs DOC offered for me, which were voices, alternative to violence, and even the meditation program. Each of these had a major impact on me because it taught me things I didn't know or disregarded in my youth. It helped shape my rehabilitation. And when I say rehabilitation, I mean it in its purest form, which is to restore the former state or to reestablish the good name I once possessed. I also chose to seek higher education to create a better life for myself once I'm released. I have a lot that I want to achieve now that I failed to achieve before. I've maintained a 3.92 GPA in college for business, and it showed me that I am more capable of making it in this world as a hardworking citizen. To be the best version of myself, I first had to tell myself that if I quit now, then they'll be right about me. Then I told myself, life is a result of the choices I make. That it'll take time, but I can't give up. 
I will make it through stronger than ever. I kept focused and I stayed positive while staying out of trouble. And I haven't looked back since. I live by the philosophy that in order to have the things you want in life, you must work hard and make the tough sacrifices to accomplish those goals. I believe being a part of the American Vet Dog Program was a major contributor to my growth. It showed me and taught me a lot about patience, compassion, good judgment, and leadership. I believe training dogs is one of the biggest life experiences I've had. This program allowed me to help and assist veterans in their lives, and I gained a passion for this, especially knowing I committed a crime against someone who didn't deserve it and deprived them of a peace of mind. That this was my chance to get back to my community and start to right the wrongs I made in my youth. And I'm very thankful to have trained multiple dogs to help the ones who serve this country. And now I've dedicated myself to helping people who are in need of it. I acknowledge the only way I could move on in life was to be accountable for my actions. And since I've done that, my life has been a lot better. The final step to close this chapter of my life is to reintegrate back into society as a productive citizen with a purpose to achieve all my goals. I believe a commutation would help me because it would give me a chance to restore any and all relationships being in prison has put a strain on. I have a father who's dealing with an addiction that I need to help before it's too late. A commutation would also benefit me. It would allow me to get the medical attention I need that I'm not receiving in this facility currently. It would also benefit me because I would be able to get married to my be beautiful fiance and start a family. I believe it will benefit society and myself because it would give me the opportunity to be a hardworking individual who will continue to train service dogs for retired veterans at the foundation. It would also benefit society because I can become a CEO of my own company by pushing my invention called Smart Alarm to help dozens of communities. I will also start my youth basketball league to help troubled youth learn skills that they lack. My release will reflect good on the board and even DOC because it will show a plethora of individuals what hard work, determination, positive productivity, and rehabilitation actually looks like. I've been counted out so many times in my life that I strive for excellence and use every inch of my success as my positive motivation to always be the best version of myself. I believe the board and the community will overwhelmingly be satisfied with my release and would not regret it. I believe my work ethic prison conduct and overall rehabilitation as a whole can speak for me in regards to this. And I am more than determined to make everyone who takes a chance on me proud and closing. In order to change who we are on the outside, we must first change who we are on the inside. Mistakes are the portals of discovery. So if we're committed, then we'll find a way. If we're not, we'll make excuses. Our life, our income, and our rewards are determined by the way we use our time. And I'm proud of the way I've used my time. If you look at a person as they are, they will always remain that way or may be worse. But if you look at a person as what they could be, they will grow into what they should be. Honorable ladies and gentlemen of the board, thank you for your time. Thank you for your statement, uh, Mr. White. We have reviewed, the panel has reviewed a complete file, which includes information from the time of arrest through the court proceedings and your time with the Department of Corrections. So we're very familiar with your case. We do have questions for you, sir. When we're done with our questions, we'll turn the hearing over to the Office of Victim Services for input, followed by input from State's Attorney Shannon. We'll then deliberate and give you our decision here today. Okay? okay. Yes.
let's begin with what was your offer before you went to jury trial, sir? My offer, I believe it was 30 years suspended after 14, five years probation. And why did you reject that offer? I rejected the offer because I didn't feel like it was a fair offer. And my lawyer at the time told me not to accept the offer because he felt he could get a better deal. Okay, so you were following the advice of your attorney. Correct. Rejected that offer. Hmm. Okay. I, I wonder if at the time, did you know with a home invasion conviction, you would earn no risk reduction earned credits while you're incarcerated that you had to do day for day? I did not know that. No. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, and and the the penalties, of course, the, the enhancements cannot be commuted at all. You understand that? Yes. Maybe you don't understand that. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that last year, your one of your co-defendants received a sentence modification. So he's up for parole next year. Another one has, the other one has been out since uh, 2020 in the community. Um, you committed this crime at the age of 19, right? Yes. Okay. So how did you guys come up with this awful, stupid plan? It was. The pl I can't say it was a plan. I, I, I would say that a co-defendant who had experience with it, he proposed it and it just came about. It wasn't a thing that we actually acted on. It wasn't until when we met up in life because I knew one of the individuals prior to being incarcerated and it came about and they pushed for it and it just happened. And it was a bad mistake that I wish I never made. So you were with, you knew one of your co-defendants and the other one was a friend of the, the co-defendant you knew? Yes, they they were um, cell, they were cellmates in prison and that's how okay. they got well acquainted. Yes. Oh, right, right. Um, so maybe you're too young to know about uh, the incident that really led to the, the home invasion laws in our state. Um, but this most certainly was a plan. You know, we no one will. You can't argue that it wasn't because you followed this poor victim home because of the car he was driving. He was targeted um, and held at gunpoint, not knowing what would happen to him. Um, very serious offense, and you know, I hope that over the last ten and a half years, you've given some real thought to what you put this victim through. It, it's just unacceptable behavior. Uh, would you say that you were a follower at that time or a leader? I could say I was a follower because mm -hmm. to be a leader would have been to tell them that what we was doing was wrong. Yeah. So why did you receive the, the greatest amount of time on this sentence, sir? I believe I received the greatest amount of time because I took it to trial by not taking accountability and being responsible for my actions. Yeah, because initially you were offered the same the, the same sentence that uh, Mr. Lee got. So yeah, I mean, it probably was because you went to trial. Okay, um, and, and, and the truth of the matter is you were you were out from a prior incarceration less than two weeks when this happened, right? Well, yes, um, it was um, a case that was gnarly, but yes. But, but you had spent some time incarcerated. I don't, was it gnarly? I don't know that it was gnarly. Was it gnarly? No. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't gnarly. You have a conviction for that. That was a, a domestic violence offense. Well, 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 that was... Um, that was um, in the before um, the um, arrest warrant on this case. Okay, but anyhow, yes. you 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 understand what I'm saying here. You didn't even yes, give I yourself a chance out in the community. At, at that point, were you involved with the Bloods? No. So that happened after your incarceration. Well, well, no. Um, 
I'm mistakenly believed to have been affiliated with that group. I am not affiliated with that group. Well, how do you explain your tattoo? Well, it means multiple things. It's ambiguous. It means my own boss. It also means uh, money over. You know what it means. What are you? What is? What are you telling us it means? <laughs> my own boss. Really? And where did you get the idea to tattoo MOB for my own boss on yourself? Well, it's it's the frequented tattoo on a lot of individuals. A well, lot but of the people. frequented meaning is a, a gang member. We know that. But you're saying you were never affiliated with the gang? No. Okay. All right. So at, at the time of sentencing, you denied committing the crime, right? Yes. Why? Because I just lacked accountability and responsibility. I just didn't want to take ownership for what I have done. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's talk about your growth since then, because it's it's not all bad here. You were 19 years old. You're still young. You're 30 years old, but you've done a lot during this incarceration. You took good programming. Uh, we received excellent evaluations from the program facilitators. You participated in the vet dog program where you're training dogs to help our veterans. Uh, you've been working. Where are you working now? Well, I just um, been transferred to this facility. Facility. I'm in the process of getting a job now. So, okay. So prior to that, you were a, a, a detail worker. Is that what you did last? Yes. In the visiting room. Yes. And how long? How long were you at that position? Um, until I got transferred recently. Yeah. How long were you in that position? Total. Approximately six months or something because before that I was um working as a, a dog trainer for the vet dog program for and a how year. How long did for how long? A little over a year. What so you were one year with the vet dog program. Okay. And you were a tierman prior to that for how long? I was a tierman after that, before and after to be okay. political to be correct. Okay. Um uh, all right and you've been taking College courses through as none talk, is that right? Yes. How many credits do you have? I have 15 credits. Okay, so you completed uh, five classes. Are you currently in classes now? Yes. Okay, how many classes are you taking now? Just one. Okay, what is it? College and career success. Okay. All right, you've had in 10 and a half years, uh, two disciplinary reports, which is, I mean, that's great to see. It's rare for us, especially when, when you come in younger. Um, one of them was a contraband in 2000, okay, was that? Yeah, 2016, so that was um, earlier on, but why were you smoking marijuana? I was still awfully newly incarcerated. I I have no justification for my actions. I take full accountability for it. I was just following. Okay. Uh, but you weren't new. I mean, yeah, you came in July of 13. All right. And then uh, more recently, a year and a half ago, you got a ticket for possession of sexual materials. What was that all about? Yes, those were some photo, some old photographs that were allowed into the facility that was put in the envelope that was in my cell that um, was found. And I have no justification for that either. I take full ownership for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do you think you've had your biggest growth during this my incarceration? Biggest, my biggest growth, I would say is the skills I've acquired, the mentorship that I've taken on to other individuals to be a better person, uh, molded myself to be better so everybody else could look at me as a standard, the one to follow behind. Mm -hmm. Have you mentored formally in any of the programs? No, I have not. Okay. All right. Are you? Have you been in any specialized units in the facilities? 
as um pertaining to like when you say specialized, can you be specific, please? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I didn't research what facilities you've been in, but there's an honor unit at one of the facilities, a true unit at another facility. There's different. Um, oh, so you, okay, so like the uh, Second Chance Alliance, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, so right. that's um a facility for like uh, level two um inmates, and okay, um you would have to have a significant amount of time, um, a small margin of time left when you're incarceration to uh, get yeah. to that facility. And okay. um, I don't think I fit the bill for the true program. Understood, right, yeah, okay. So we did receive a, a lot of support letters for you from uh, family members and, and your girlfriend. What are your goals in life for your future? Tell us what you intend to do when you ultimately are released. I I intend to be a CEO of my own company, which I invented. Um, we Smart did, Alarm. We did read uh, your business proposal on the Smart. It's pretty ironic that you know you want you want to start a company for an alarm to help people when you know you committed a home invasion. But anyhow, we did read that business proposal, and that's. That's a long-term goal, right? That takes a lot of work, time, right. effort, money. Right. So what are your short-term goals? My short-term goals is to start a youth mm -hmm. basketball league, um, yeah. to get a, get a job. Um, and just Where are you going to work? Where's your job? Where do you want to work? To start, I'm going to be working at Garbage and Recycling in Southington, Connecticut. Well, we did get something. Yeah, uh, we, I did see that. HQ Dumpsters and Recycling. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. That's good. And you say you want to get married. Yes. I mean, you have to crawl before you can walk, right? I mean, you I, haven't even had a relationship outside of, of prison. So slow down there. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you've been incarcerated a long time. So, uh, you know, you have to be patient. But most importantly, when you are released, however you're released, because ultimately you are eligible for parole. So regardless of what happens today, eventually um, you will be released, whether you EOS to probation or not. Um, it's very important that you accept any support, services, programming, whatever's offered to you. You understand? Yes, I do. Yeah. Because uh, we certainly wouldn't want you to make any, any other poor decisions. This was a very, very poor decision to get involved. Uh, in this type of situation. And we certainly hope that you have learned from it. Thank you for speaking with me. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Page, at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Mr. White, have you seen um, or come across any of your co-defendants while you've been down? No. no. And so, um, your, have you sought any other forms of relief prior to this commutation? Yes, um, I believe I have a habeas pending, a habeas appeal pending. On what grounds? On the grounds of ineffective assistance of counsel. And what makes it makes what makes your ineffective your counsel ineffective? Well, the grounds that he was ineffective was he failed to adequately cross-examine and things of that nature, fell into um um um, seek out um, plea offers. It was a, a ample amount of things. I can't recollect them all. Okay. And anything else besides that, Javier? No. I see something. You did something in November of 2019. No. Was that a, was that direct appeal? It says application for writ habeas corpus. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yes. That was in 2018. And then you had something else. I'm just curious because so when when you ask for these. Have you been granted any other like a hearing or and stuff like that? No, I only thing that I know pertaining to the writ of habeas corpus is um, that is it was denied. Uh, initially from the court, the habeas court itself in Rockville, and um, it's pending appeal currently. 
Okay. All right. Um, so what do you think the impact uh, that your actions have on this victim? That, that you know, when you're trying to seek relief and, and they receive these notifications that you're trying to sit, you're, you're seeking relief. What, what do you think the impact is? I believe the impact is trauma or um, memory, bring back old thoughts of what happened that night. Over and over, you know, over, you think, and, over. Yeah, over yes. and over, exactly. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to move on with my life, but every single time I, I'm getting another notification. I mean, I, I understand that it's your right. You um, you can apply for whatever you want, you know, and, and I get it. I'm just thinking about um, the victim that's involved in this case. And as the chair said, you know, that's that's scary. What you guys said was scary. You followed this man just because of the car that he was driving. Well, if it... Would you have done the same thing you think to a woman? No, but I, I will be truthful. The initial thought that night was to target a couple, which was also wrong, but that plan died. So, but no. And whose idea did you say it was? It was, it was a co-defendant involved. Um, with the case, I don't know if I can say names. Huh? Lee, they planned it in prison during a prior incarceration. Wow, this is this is so crazy. Um, I, I, I'm I'm certainly happy that um, you are remorseful for your actions. I just think I, when I see stuff like this, I just think, well, what if it was your mom or your sister or your grandma who was a victim in this crime. How would you feel about that? I would be devastated. And that's one of the main reasons why I've taken full accountability for it, because I understand the wrong and the pain that I caused this individual and nobody should ever have to go through such a life altering event. Yeah, that's pretty, I mean, going just a normal course of his day, he's going home, which he's entitled to do, you know, um, so I, um, I'm happy to see the strides that you've made, Mr. White. I, we did receive your uh, college transfer with your 3.92 GPA. Congratulations on that. I really do hope that you continue and follow through with your education. Um, we also did read your, about your tumultuous uh, upbringing, you know, it, 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 it looks like you were struggling from the wound, you know, you were getting in trouble all the time. You just, you just didn't listen. Um, and it, it sounds like this period of incarceration finally got your attention. You know, it, you finally said, okay, what do I need to do to change who I am? Because I don't want to keep going in and out of prison, um, which ultimately I'm happy for you haven't committed any other crime. So that makes me sleep a little better at night. So, um, and I am also happy that you've completed a number of positive programs. So in a perfect world, uh, Mr. White, there's my, my every personal question. What, if your sentence was commuted here today, what, what would you like to see happen? Well, as in, I'm, I'm a little perplexed with the question, just a little bit. Um, I'm not sure so, if you... I'm, I'm asking you, what would, what amount of time do you think should be redu reduced, your, your sentence should be reduced to based on what you're asking? So wait, let me start here. So you're asking for a commutation. Your, your premise for asking for a commutation is because of your conduct in the facility? Oh, I would say conduct, overall rehabilitation, um, and just the new person that I am. But you realize that that's what prison is supposed to do, right? It's supposed yes. to rehabilitate. That's the purpose. And yes. so um, the, the judge rendered a sentence to you with that intention of you being rehabilitated. 
now. That said, now that you are rehabilitated, how much time do you think that you should serve for this for this offense? Honestly, I feel the time I should serve is around 13 to 14 years. As the and state wants to offer. 13 to 14 years. And how long have you been down there? 10 and a half years. So. You're basically saying that seven, seven years, six or seven years should come off your sentence. Um, so I just I know that we're not commuting this sentence, but I'm just curious about this tampering with the witness. When you call the girl more than one time trying to get her to tell her boyfriend not to testify. Like what what was your what was the purpose? Did you not think that they were going to find out? No, I didn't think that I I felt that. Um... I just felt that I was trying to prevent somebody from getting up there and damaging the situation yeah. more. I was just being um, deceitful. Selfish. Yes, and yeah. selfish. And selfish. Yes. I mean, especially after the victim and George, you, you know, the three of you in the house. I don't care if you said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I, although I can appreciate that, I'm sorry does not replace the terror that I'm sure that he went through. Um, because you invaded his house. Okay, um, thank you. I'm all set. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. I'm looking for the information. No, oh, okay. oh, now they were older. I yeah, I was aware of that actually. Uh, Mr. Paul. No question. Okay. So at this time, we're going to turn the hearing over to the Office of Victim Services for input. Ms. De Jesus, thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, board members. I do have a statement and it reads as follows. This victim impact statement is from me, the victim of the, cr the crimes associated with this inmate. It is the recommendation of the victim that this inmate should not be eligible for early release, but serve the full legal sentence handed down to him by a jury in the Litchfield County Court. The crimes committed have impacted the victim since that event emotionally and has changed the way he conducts daily life. Doors are constantly locked. Exterior lights are on once darkness, darkness takes over. No exceptions. The victim is in constant awareness of his surroundings of and of strangers. Not a day goes by that the victim doesn't relive that event. The victim believes this inmate never truly had any remorse for his crimes as did the other two inmates involved in the home invasion. One other inmate plea bargained very soon after being arrested and the other inmate was cooperative with the law enforcement and has now been released to a halfway house under supervision. But this inmate went so far as to take his plea to a court of law, pleading his innocence despite all the, excuse me, despite all the overwhelming evidence against him and despite all the strong advice from many in the judicial system to not proceed. This ongoing event was delayed time and time again, only adding an incredible amount of anxiety and emotional stress to the victim's psyche. These emotional scars are still haunting the victim. With all the concrete evidence against the inmate in court, along with the jury's very quick unanimous guilty verdict, the victim strongly believes this inmate should serve the full sentence handed down to him by that jury of his peers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jesus. Okay, so at this time, we'll turn the hearing over to State's Attorney Shannon. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for this opportunity to address the board. Um, I would also object to um, any um, downward departure from the sentence that was handed out. Um, I'd like to indicate one of my main arguments is, is that I, I, it's interesting to hear him express remorse and, and admission to committing a crime. 
Um, but I'll just point out that his petition for a habeas, uh, his habeas petition and his petition for a new trial, um, the decision just came out on that um, in 2020, January of 2023. So it's not until that point that he's expressed any remorse or sorrow for what he did. Um, I was the trial lawyer for this case. Uh, Mr. White has indicated to you that he rejected the order on his, rejected the offer on his lawyer's advice. Um, I'll just point out that for almost two years, the defendant represented himself. He had fired uh, his initial public defender, a very experienced part A pro, uh, public defender, um, represented himself for about a year and a half to two years, and then uh, elected to have standby counsel attorney Dennis McDonough, and then I think attorney McDonough was ultimately his trial counsel. So somebody who's comfortable enough representing himself in a serious case like this, um, I, I just don't believe that they would reject the offer on the advice of their attorney. And most defense attorneys I know don't tell a client to take it or not take it. They basically lay out their options and risks and uh, et cetera. Um, I also recollect from my prosecution of the case, members of the board, that this defendant was the leader of the group. Um, that's what Mr. Henry Lee said. That's what the other individual said. Uh, based on the phone calls, uh, when he got out of jail, he was the one who was calling people. Uh, the evidence was to um, to do this crime. He was the moving force behind it. Um, and then the other thing I'll say that it may or, the board may or may not be aware of, because I'm impressed by how much the homework you guys clearly do, how diligent you are and how you know about the facts and the tattoo and everything. Um, but one, the reason why I got involved in this case is this defendant um, leading up to the trial had uh, enlisted, had, had approached another inmate who knew the prosecutor who was assigned the case and was trying to get information out of that other uh, inmate uh, or pretrial detainee trying to get information out of him as to where the prosecutor lived and was threatening to physically harm that prosecutor. Um, so the case was transferred to me. So he was the leader. Uh, he, he was the moving force. He was not remorseful in any way. Uh, finally, I'll say as far as the, the, the impact on the victim, which is I know factor clearly you all consider. Um, I did not know the victim, but I've gotten to know the victim since this trial. Um, and he is an artist, he's a professional photographer, and I've had the privilege to go to one of his exhibits um, after, long after this trial, and there's a, a darkness, a theme of darkness that runs through some of the art that he creates, and it, and it relates uh, images of the gun that was used, the hat that was worn, uh, so it's clear that it's, it's had a profound impact on him, uh, separate apart from obviously what he said in that letter to you all. Um, I, I, I've seen the impact it's had on him, and, and these things never cease to affect victims. So for all those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, I, I would um, object, any, object any departure, a downward departure in the sentence. And I want to again, thank you for your attention. Attorney Shannon, can I just, I want to rewind for a second. Did you say that his latest habeas petition was denied? Yeah, I, I, I printed these things out this morning. Clearly the date of birth was wrong on that, but I have a, a, a Westlaw citation. Um, the docket number was LLICR 130143351T. Uh, and it says that, uh, oh, actually, no, that's the wrong docket number. That's a pretrial motion. Um, White versus Commissioner of Correction, docket number 18400942 and docket number 20501490. Yes. According to this, the petition, uh, the court denies both the habeas petition and the petition for a new trial. Okay. Your, your documents don't have a... a well, the last file final order, I have an order for 823, um, 8-8-2023, and then 1-4. It says complete copies of the court file sent to the Supreme Appellate Court in September of last year. So it doesn't have, but it was okay. a decision. Was All right. Uh, thank you for your statement, Attorney Shannon. So at this point, uh, Mr. White, the panel will enter into deliberation. You can listen to our deliberation and we will give you our decision shortly. Okay. That's our, are your thoughts that this is a new proceeding? No. No. Okay. All right. Well, this is a difficult one. It really is. It, I, I mean, uh, a horrific crime. I just can't imagine and understand. I thank the victim for his statement today. 
uh, certainly would imagine this would impact you for the rest of your life, your your daily routines and um, habits, and of course, leaving lights on and locking doors and what have you. Um, uh, so I certainly do understand where the victim is coming from. Uh, on, on the other hand, he was 19 years old at the time. Um, I, I'll, to be honest, perfectly honest, I, I had hopes that he would present a little better here today. Um, but I, I assumed in reading some of the documents from from the the institution that there would be a little more presented today that I was unaware of. But uh, I think it, it's actually the opposite. Um, so while I do believe that he is on the right path and certainly has grown over the last 10 and a half years, uh, I'm not certain that it rises to uh, the standard of exceptional and compelling. Uh, still some concerns about uh, the offenses, uh, some of the behaviors during incarceration uh, and uh, the fact that he went to trial, you know, we know that that's a that's a risk you take, and, and you're going to get more time if, if the offer only goes up from there, uh, or the time only goes up from from the offer. Um, I certainly hope that he's sincere and that he continues on his positive path and starts the youth basketball league and and has a successful business with the alarm and and can work and turn this all around because he's still very young. Uh, but I'd like to hear my colleagues thoughts. Ms. Page. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree that, you know, this this crime was a, a, Yeah, I'm just like, I wasn't even a part of it, but it's just frightening, you know, just to think that these kinds of things are being planned inside the prison. So um, that, that aside, um, you know, I, I'm I'm I have great weight on Mr. White's age. This yeah. man is really, really, really smart. Like he's yeah. really smart. I mean, he's done all the things that he has been doing on his own. Like, I mean, representing himself and mm -hmm. um, advocating for himself um, with uh, this for this conversation. Um, I I just I want to say that at 19 years old, you know. The brain's not fully developed. You know all about the science and all that stuff. Um, and I heard Mr. White say that um, he would have liked to serve 14 years or so for. Um, not, no, he didn't. He, he said 13 or 14. So yeah. he should have just taken the offer. Nonetheless, Madam Chair, he, this man came in without his GED. You know he. Um, he's gotten a GED. He's, he's in college. He really is trying to educate himself. He has goals and aspirations. He has the love and support of his family, um, despite his behaviors. Um, he's working there in the facility. Well, he's not working now, but he's done some good work in the yeah. vet dog program, and um, yeah. he seems to um, ha have taken. Um, some, some good programs and have some good insight from the program based on um, his opening statement and the documents that he's provided. So I honestly um, think that I would support um, his request for commutation, Madam Chair, and I'm not going to say that it rises to the level of exceptional or but the compelling, the compelling issue to me is that he was 19 years old and um, that he, you really can't see some growth in his behavior since he's been there in the facility. So I'm not going to say uh, I'd take off five years, but I would, I would uh, listen to your, your thoughts. Okay, uh, Mr. Paul. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, certainly, I've heard the victim in this case. You know the extent of what's happened and how do you lose security in some of the uh person in your home this way you know it's, it's just it shakes somebody for a long time 
Uh, I heard uh, Attorney Shannon, and, uh, you know, his concerns. Um, I'm also concerned for me with what is real justice when you're looking at the other two uh, individuals here. And I'm, you know, uh, this sentence doesn't look like the other two at all. Um, you know, and I think I have uh, a little bit of a concern, well, more than a little bit of a concern when they, you know, that part part. Mm -hmm. um, where I get to exceptional and compelling is looking at programming that he's gone through. Uh -huh. uh, there isn't anything and since uh, 2016. Uh, there was DR 2022. There was totally non. Uh, um, it, was right. a, it was a nonviolent DR. But what he has done is taken and looked at his behavior, looks at looked at substance use. Um, took voices to come to understand what victims go through. Uh, huge thing for me is the three dogs that he trained as part of the vet dog program. Um, and it's non puck with the second L program, a 3.9 GPA uh, in business administration. Uh, says something about commitment to mm -hmm. change and wanting to do something different. Uh, you know, he has support in the community. Uh, and letters a lot of family support there. Um, a letter from a life coach and the uh, person that goes in facility with uh, mindfulness and meditation and that type of stuff to change and to think about behavior in a different way. Um, I would, uh, in, this, in this case, I would support a commutation of a certain amount of time that uh, certainly I okay. gave the picture for spouse. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Paul. All right, so it sounds like um, we're headed towards a break. Um, to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't be interested in touching the home invasion. I think that the, the 10 years is appropriate for that. We cannot touch the uh, the penalties, the enhancement penalties, um, and the conspiracy to burglar one. Again, I think those those were appropriate sentences. So, if anything, I would say. Take some time off the consecutive tampering with a witness. And what, how much time is that? <laughs> That's a five year consecutive sentence. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. Jake, three years off of that, or? Yeah. What are your thoughts? I, I think that that's a, that's a compromise. Um, it, yeah, we. I was oh, oh, between three. Yeah, three to five is what I was thinking. So five would negate the sentence altogether. So three is appropriate, I think. Uh, uh, Mr. Paul, that's three would still have him incarcerated until So. Um, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he, he's parole yeah. eligible. So at eighty-five right. percent. So. Um, you know, that's uh, three years from now. So it's not threat. It's not anything that looks like right away. No, no, he would have to keep working on himself and, and hope for the best when he gets in front of parole. Uh, a parole panel. And still, they still may even have an issue with the, the, the DR 
been as recent. So I think that the, just a couple more years. Couple more yeah, yeah, we don't know. Yeah. 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 Just a, a little, uh, some more time to prove himself and continue working. And he's doing well, but. Okay. Are we in agreement? So from 32 to 29, 20, excuse me? 10, 10 executions suspended after five to 10 executions suspended but, after two. No, his, his uh, date is 33. So, okay, so it'll be 30, right? Yeah, okay. well, I don't know. Yeah, however, the, the DOC calculates that. So for our purposes, we'll commute three years from the tampering with a witness okay. conviction. In the matter of Andre White, inmate number 391232, the panel finds that there are exceptional or compelling circumstances. Um, and I'll make a motion to commute the tampering with a witness uh, conviction. We'll commute three years from the sentence, bringing it to a two year sentence, followed by five years probation, overall sentence being seven, no, yeah. Wait, what's my math? 17 years plus five years of probation. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a second to motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. White, do you understand what we just did? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, keep working on yourself. You will be eligible for parole, but you have to serve 85% of your, your sentence first, and then it's up to the panel um, at that time whether or not you're, you're paroled. Uh, we wish you the best. We thank you, Attorney Shannon, for your participation and the Office of Victim Services and the victim as well. Thank you. Thank you. This now concludes the March 15, 2024 commutation commutation of the Connecticut Board of Pardon and Parole for inmate Andre White, inmate number 391232. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you. This now concludes the March 13, 2024 commutation session of Connecticut Board of Pardons and Paroles at 340. I know we want to exactly. Hang on. Okay, so how do we impact this? Um, I'm going to just share my thoughts and then we'll go into the court transcripts to talk about what happened with the crime. And thank you, Richard, for providing it. And I hope you are healing from your surgery. It's March 21st, the time of this recording. I haven't yet heard from him, but that was expected. So mm, I, I for one, was was impressed by the way that the board handled this hearing. They were much more, they were much um, more diligent and I think tough in a way of handling the interview. That was Paige, who I was leading the interview and was talking about the tattoos. And I was impressed by that. And so was the DA. Uh, that they had done their homework. Where all of it begins to fall flat for me is the idea that they rewarded him with any type of commutation. Now, I, I can play devil's advocate on that by saying, look, he he's, he's put his, I can't say his best foot forward, but he's done decently well in prison. And to reward him so that, and I've seen them say this, hey, they're going to go back to their other inmates and, and say something and there should be some type of, you know, reward that's given for doing well and so that others can hear about it. But that's playing devil's advocate. The bottom line is he still showed up to this hearing and lied. And that's you can't get rewarded for lying and trying to make a mockery of the board. We know what that tattoo stands for. Don't have the, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for to, to, to just call them. They clearly know what the tattoo stands for and to sit there with a straight face and say that it doesn't. The moment that happens, I say everything's out the window because you can already see how he thinks. That's my opinion on the matter. You just got to own it. You got to admit it. Now, he might know, you know, it, why wouldn't it be okay to say, I was a part of the gang, but I'm not anymore. Are there legal repercussions that we don't know about? Would they classify him differently in the prison? 
I don't think so. I mean, if you if you renounce your involvement, you renounce your involvement. But I'll tell you, if it if it, on the flip side, I can imagine that any blood gang members who heard that would probably not be very happy if someone says if if someone put a a, a, a member ink on them and it wasn't and they weren't actually a member. That's that's probably um, grounds for getting really wrecked. But. <laughs> I and I can't really get over that part. Um, it, 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 there was something about him too, where he just had this certain type of like confidence and ego and maybe narcissism. I mean, even when he got like the hit, the the approval of slight commutation, he didn't say thank you. I mean, which you just kind of expect something like thank you, I appreciate it, I'll do great. There was some type, but no, it was just. And then um, and and. Of course, as the DA pointed out, he uh, he well, he's only accepting his guilt now after after his his uh, his final his final I guess um, appeal was was denied um, only recently, and it's it, it is crazy to think this crime only happened 2013. He got a 20 year sentence. It's now it's now he, he dragged it through the courts. It's 2024, which is which is. 11 years after the initial crime and he's you know going through all his legal legal actions and he exhausted his final appeal and now he's he's doing this so he definitely is intelligent but at the same time it it makes you wonder about about like there's certain th things that and maybe you just have to be young but really you want to make an you want to make a better alarm system you might as well have gotten up there and said you're gonna make a better mousetrap it's it's just ridiculous like so you know someone might be intelligent but it doesn't make them smart i guess um and it doesn't make him smart also the idea that when you find out um parts of we'll we'll read through this but part of the evidence they used against him for even getting in, indicted in this crime is that they have his recorded jail phone calls to his mother um, where he was talking about how as soon as he gets out of jail, which is what he did, two, he was out two weeks when he committed this crime, they're going to do something to get money, to have it all planned. And they use those calls as evidence against him. And then when he gets locked back up, he actually on the calls again and gets caught trying to intimidate the DA. And that's why a new DA shows up. And then comes to this case and says, by the way, I came in because the prior DA was, was in danger, potentially. Maybe they thought it was a conflict of interest once they caught him, so he had to recuse himself. But so, again, you can have some, some smarts, but still be an idiot, which, which, in my opinion, he clearly is. Um, I don't know how he only got 20 years. How do you commit these crimes, get caught? for trying to attack or eliminate the district attorney and still only end up with a 20 year sentence. That is impossible for me to understand, um, but it's Connecticut. Now you can say, well, it was only a home invasion and da da da, but, but, but I don't know if you caught on when they mentioned, she mentioned the home invasion aspect. Um, that's because in Connecticut, there was a hallmark situation, if hallmark's the right word. There's a notable case. It's in Wikipedia. I don't even want to go through it. It's like it's like the, the Voldemort word in Connecticut. It was the most horrific, disturbing home invasion. They mentioned it in a prior hearing that we did, and I looked it up and did it on stream. I don't want to look it up again, but it was so demonic that uh, what the men did to this family and their young children um that connecticut then passed all these laws where they take home invasions like as the most serious crime so that's part of what they're referring to as well so let's go through it well one of the three men held the victim at gunpoint and okay so, sorry so this is i was reading for it 
Late in the day of April 7, 2013, Dunning was driving an automobile on Interstate 84 in Hartford, Connecticut. And the defendant um, uh, and, and Lay were his passengers. The three men observed the victim, Peter, who was driving a BMW sport utility vehicle. The men decided to follow the victim after observing that he had appeared to be alone, that he was a white male in his 40s or 50s, and he was driving an expensive automobile. Which, by the way, I always say is like, come on, like, you can lease any car these days, but whatever. The men followed the victim from Hartford to his residence in New Hartford. The victim arrived at his residence at approximately 11.30 p.m. As the victim approached the back door of his residence, the defendant, Lee, and Dunning, all of whom had their faces concealed, confronted him. The victim was approached first by two of the three men, one of whom was brandishing a gun. Oh, I didn't know they allowed guns in Connecticut. Oh, you mean bad guys have guns? Oh, I never thought of that. Anyways. They ordered the victim to put his hands up. The third man, with his face covered, then approached the victim from the right side. The men ordered the victim to give them his wallet and his cell phone. At gunpoint, the victim complied. The men then asked the victim whether anyone was inside the residence and whether he had a dog or an alarm system. Huh. <laughs> wow. Is that when he came up with his brilliant new mousetrap idea? I love I like I love how um, how uh, how Paige said, oh, "Isn't that ironic?" <clears throat> think you know? Just thank God he didn't have family and kids. Could you just imagine? I mean, they didn't know what they were getting into. They didn't know it was a man who was alone. And then he he freely admitted that they initially were going to target a couple. After the victim informed them that nobody else was, was at home and that he did not have an alarm system, the men forced the victim inside his residence. For the next 45 to 50 minutes, the defendant, Dunning and Lee, confined the victim to a chair in his kitchen. They searched the contents of an overnight bag that the victim had been carrying. They repeatedly asked the victim if he owned a safe, to which he replied, no. They removed a credit card and an automatic teller machine, ATM. That's funny. I never realized that, that, that that's what the abbreviation stood for. Automatic teller machine from his wallet. One of the men demanded that the ATM cards ask for the pin card. The victim replied that he was only able to remember the letters corresponding to his pin number. You know how it's like the letters on, which is funny because I, I never think of the letters. I think just of the numbers, but I hear, I get what he's saying though. But that is interesting. One of the men ripped a telephone off the wall and demanded that he provide them with the numbers. So he rips it off and says, which letters is it? After the victim provided the PIN number, they demanded the keys to the victim's automobile, asked him where the nearest ATM was located, and left the residence. Lee returned to the victim's residence a short time later, having withdrawn funds from the victim's bank account at the ATM in New Hartford. Why are they calling him Lee? Is that? Let me. I don't know why they're calling him Lee because this it's state versus white, which is the computation we just saw. Um, it's confusing me a little bit, but. It, it is it does clearly show he is the ringleader and on that note that's again more he th it's not just the manipulation that these inmates do that we see but it's the the idea that they think that they're still the smartest person in the room when he says it was such a calculated answer i i wasn't a leader i was a follower because if i was a leader i would have stopped it from happening and it's like you you do you just think we're a bunch of idiots like, just say you were the leader. They have all the information. Um, and I think it's just the insight into a criminal mind. You could say he's also young, but... And, and the idea that he wanted to represent himself, that's... that's uh, it just fits perfectly with his personality, I guess. 
Approximately one hour later, the defendant um, and Dunning left the crime scene. Dunning used the victim's ATM card and ATM at Hartford. Da -da -da. The victim attempted the victim's credit card at the supermarket. While one of the three men held the victim at gunpoint in the kitchen, they each took turns ransacking every room in the residence in search of valuables. The men brought various items to the kitchen. Thereafter, Dunning parked his automobile in the victim's driveway. While the victim continued... Uh, oh, that's so smart. They parked their own car in the driveway. While the victim continued to be held at gunpoint, he had, uh, as he had been through the entire incident, the men carried several of the victim's possessions to Dunning's automobile. Among the possessions removed from the residence were an overnight bag, two long rifles. He had guns. Huh. That just surprises me in Connecticut. Two long rifles, a box of shotgun shells, camera equipment, a gold watch, a laptop computer, a hunting knife, mm -hmm. and a large vase that contained approximately $75 in coins. Is that $75 in coins, really? Um, they took his they took his coin vase. <laughs> Are you kidding me? The shotgun shells, as well as a black ski mask, were discovered in the defendant's bedroom, seized by the police during the subsequent search of his residence in East Hartford. Yeah, he's so smart that he doesn't even know how to throw away a ski mask. Surveillance videos from a supermarket in East Hartford show that during the, the morning of April 8, 2013, the defendant, who was accompanied by Lee, deposited approximately $68 in a coin exchange machine, resulting in a receipt of $62. And these guys are such idiots! <laughs> I mean, come on, man. During the police investigation of this case and, and police uh, questioning the defendant, the defendant initially denied hanging out with Lee. Police investigators. And he was not at the supermarket on April 8, 2013. After the police told the defendant the witness they identified as being at the supermarket at the time, the defendant told the police officer that the request had accompanied Lee to the supermarket. After the victim was ordered to turn around, the defendant uh, and Dunning exited the residence, and they quickly fled the scene uh, in the in Dunning's automobile. The victim went to the neighbor's residence, requested for help. The victim neighbor called 911, and the police arrived at the scene quickly thereafter. So it's like one thing you can look at is say, hey, there's three kids. They went into his house. They held him at gunpoint, but it doesn't seem that they hit him. It doesn't seem that, you know, they didn't beat him. Uh, they didn't tie him up. They didn't physically harm him. And some might say, hey, you know, it's like, but Connecticut, like I said, they take home invasions extraordinarily seriously because of that event. They change the legislation for it. And it's like, it's like I said, the Voldemort of Connecticut. You don't meant you don't even mention it. Um, and I, I don't want to go through it. It was just too it, it it took a toll on me when I went through it. But if you Google home invasion Connecticut, it will a Wikipedia page will pop up. I just warn you about it beforehand. Um, they didn't even get anything. The police later found a pair of gloves in the victim's yards. DNA testing of the gloves. Oh, that's so smart. <laughs> Wear gloves and then leave them on the scene. These guys, they should get an award. Uh, finding has been handled by Dunning and the defendant's brother, whom the defendant resided at the time. Da -da -da, okay. Following the defendant's arrest, and while he was awaiting trial on the charges at issue in the present present appeal, he had he had conversations with others in an attempt to persuade Dunning not to testify against him. During a recorded telephone conversation with the mother of Dunning, a child's person who was identified at the trial as Jasmine, the defendant explained that Dunning had provided the police with a statement that implicated him. The defendant asked Jasmine to pressure Dunning not to testify, stating that Jasmine don't like no snitches. He asked Jasmine to tell Dunning that testifying against the defendant would harm his relationship with her. He cautioned Jasmine not to let Dunning know that he called her and stated that if Dunning knew about the call, he would go back to the court and tell them. The next day, the defendant attempted to speak with Jasmine a second time. Instead, um, hold on a second, I'm getting a phone call. The next day, the defendant attempted to speak with Jasmine a second time and said he reached her boyfriend by telephone. I'm not following this Jasmine thing exactly, but I think that he's asking her to, but anyways, to maybe communicate with her brother, and not permit the defendant to speak directly with her. The defendant told Jasmine's boyfriend that he wanted Jasmine to prevent Dunning from testifying. Okay, so I think that's it, yeah. He stated that best bet was for Dunning not to testify, to not testify at all. He explained that if Dunning invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, that they can't do anything to him. The defendant also stated that he would be offered a favorable plea 
deal if Dunning refused to testify. So you see, that, again, he he doesn't understand that they're recording his phone calls. This thing, it is remarkable to me. Again, if you point it out, they, he didn't take the plea deal, and yet they still, with all the crap he's trying to do, still only gave him a 20-year sentence. Um, which I get is harsh for, for in some ways, but in some ways it's just not. Dunning, but he was just trying to, to save Dunning from getting touched. Da, 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 da. First, the defendant claimed that prosecutorial impro impropriety, impropriety that occurred during the state's examination of Dunning, as well as during the state's closing argument, deprived. Okay, so now this is his, his appeal. And just by the behalf of Mr. This is interesting. The defendant's unpreserved claim focuses on the prosecutor's examination of Dunning, as well as arguments made by the prosecutor during the state's rebuttal closing argument with respect to the examination of Dunning during a trial. The following additional facts are relevant to the present claim. Dunning was called as a witness by the state during its case in chief. Dunning appeared in prison garb so instead of wearing a suit, he appeared in his prison garb, and at the very beginning of his direct examination by the state, the prosecutor elicited testimony that he was incarcerated as a result of the role he played in the incident, giving rise to the charges that were brought against the defendant, namely the 2013 home invasion. During his testimony, he stated that he had entered into a plea agreement with the state pursuant to which he pleaded guilty, because this is the witness that's testifying against him, his buddy. Um, in the first degree, he agreed to testify in the defendant's case in exchange for a sentence between seven to nine years of imprisonment. Dunning testified that at the time of the defendant trial, he was awaiting sentence without objection, a copy of the written plea agreement, and admit okay. So, so what's this appeal for? Dunning testified about the events. With the defendant Lee and three men planned to commit the invasion following the release. Shortly after Denny was released, March 20, 2013, he, the defendant, and Lee prepared to carry out their plan to purchasing items at a home improvement store. On April 7, 2013, accompanied by the defendant and his passengers, Dunning drove behind the victim following him to his residence in Hartford. Dunning testified that when he arrived at the victim's residence, we all jumped out, got to the victim's porch, searched his pockets, got his stuff opened his door, got him inside, sat him down, and we all just searched the house for his stuff. He stated that while the victim was held at gunpoint for approximately 45 minutes, no to one hour, he, the defendant, and Lee searched the residence for valuables. During this period, they went, uh, went to the ATM, um, testified after many of the victim's possessions, including guns and cameras and equipment, were placed into the trunk of his automobile. He drove away from the scene with the defendant. Dunning testified that in July 2013, he learned that the police were interested in speaking with him and that they had executed a search warrant at his residence. Um, he voluntarily met with the police, and after they showed him photographs that incriminated him, the defendant and Lee provided a statement about the events that um, at, at issue. Dunning provided the police with the names of the defendant. He testified that later he met with the police. Once again, he transported to a police station and provided the police with a second statement. He testified that he had kind of lied a little bit with the police statement with respect to whether he had entered the victim's residence, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I know I've been doing this right now for 21 minutes, God, if any of you are still listening. Um, I don't know. I don't know how else to do it. It's just a long thing. How many of you even like when I read this much? But this is it. There's no hearing after this, so... Um, if you need to get off the, the premiere, I totally get it. Defense counsel also questioned Dunning about two written statements. I don't know. So during the state's redirect examination, uh, Dunning prosecutors further questioned him about the circumstance surrounding his plea agreement with the state. The classic, you know, um, were you given a deal type of thing?
Yeah. I think it's like the classic, well, is he a good witness? He's getting a deal, da 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 da. It's a long, I guess I can't read all of this. Following the court's ruling, the defendant appearing as a self-represented litigant filed a motion to suppress any and all evidence seized from his residence. Among the arguments raised herein, the defendant argued that there was not fair probability that the contraband or evidence of a crime would be found in his residence. The fact stated that the warrant application, I mean, he, he, he definitely, you know, has a high IQ type of guy. Um, but it, it's funny to see how, it, like, intelligence doesn't necessarily mean you're smart. There's just so many things that were just so dumb. But we see that all the time in true crime. Being, having a high IQ does not does not mean you're not an idiot. How do you feel about them? You know, like in one sense, again, he he's he's done quite well in prison, but he did have a write up last year in Louisiana. They wouldn't even like. A write up within a year of just like, are you kidding me? There's no chance. You're not getting anything. And here it was. He had a write up. He lied completely about the most basic stuff. And he literally just finished his legal um, attempts at, at, at saying he was innocent just like a few months ago and then he has this hearing and he and and they do give him a couple years off and i don't know why i i don't think you reward that i just don't i'll put the links in the description um it's funny. He left gloves. He left gloves. He put on gloves and then left them at the scene. So they had his DNA. Whoa. And then he, he takes jail phone calls. I mean, he can like, dude, like, yeah, I mean, now he's going to go and make, the, make an awesome alarm system. It's going to get out of prison and be the CEO of alarm LLC. It's going to make sure that no home invasions can happen. Okay, I'm done. For those of you who are still here, I salute you. And with that, I'll let you go. <laughs>